Please join me in welcoming back to the stage, Ethan Hawke. Wow. Is this on? Well, can I introduce everybody else? Go for it, yeah. Well, I, I was here, I had the great privilege of being here earlier today when Richard Linkletter introduced his new brilliant movie, The Hitman, which you have to see. But he was up here prancing around, bragging about how great it was not to have actors at the festival because it put the attention on the director, okay? <laughs> And I am lucky to have an interim agreement, and so I get to bring out our performers tonight. All right? I am gonna start with the beautiful actor who played Duchess, Christine Dye. Come on, Christine. The queen of Louisville herself. All right. I'm going in no particular order. Uh, my great friend, great artist, Rafael Casal. Get out here. All right. Okay. Uh, this is my, one of my favorite actors, my scene partner from First Reformed, Philip Ettinger. Yeah. All right. This uh, company was incredibly lucky to have the amazing actor Willa Fitzgerald. Will you come on out here? Come on out, Willa. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, so I made my Broadway debut on a stage very similar to like to this, only hopefully with different result tonight, because uh, I made it with Laura Linney, who is uh, the queen of our profession, my hero, Laura Linney. Yeah. Amazing. And um, this actress I, I discovered, um, <laughs> She was about four years old, and I said, you got it, Maya Hawk. Yeah. Amazing to have you here, Ethan, and your cast. Thank you so much. Come upstairs so people can see you. Okay. Um, I want to begin by, thank you, I want to begin by asking about your journey with Flannery O'Connor. I know this is a, a writer you spent a lot of time with and grappled with and thought about and, and reread. How did that journey lead to deciding to make this film? Why make this film now and what was the path towards it? Well, much to my surprise in my life, I, I never would have anticipated such a thing. I, I used to be the kind of 20-year-old uh, that would sit around smoking cigarettes in cafes talking about how bad biopics are and how much I don't like them. And I've, ton I've like made a million of them. Um, and, and, uh, but I somehow see, I've started to see other human beings' lives as these uh, windows. You know, that, that this is this beautiful window into a, another universe. And each person, I started to see Flannery as a, a window into really using her life as an opportunity to really talk about creativity and faith and the intersection of that. My mother gave me Flannery O'Connor when she saw that all I was doing was reading Hemingway and Kerouac, and she's like, you know, read some women. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, thanks, Mom. And, um, and, but I've, I left all that behind until Maya had started falling in love with Flannery O'Connor, and she has her own relationship to it, but she came to me with Flannery's prayer journal. And uh, that was a beautiful meeting ground for the two of us. It was a way to talk about your inner life, a way to talk about a life in the arts. Maya learned a lot from this, and she, I'll, I'll let her talk about it, but she had a relationship to this character and what a complicated person it was, she was. And of course, in making the movie, did a lot of research, find out how complicated she was. She was raised in the Jim Crow South. She was raised, you know, uh, in an America that is often very ugly to look at, you know? And she tried to, uh, I think I wouldn't be wrong to say that uh, hypocrisy was her great, she had an eye for the hypocrisy around her and she wrote about it in herself, exploring her own hypocrisy, hypocrisy of the society around her. And I found her an incredibly compelling figure the more I, I dug in. Thank you. 
Um, Maya, I want to go to you next and, and hear just a little bit more about your relationship with Flannery O'Connor and then filtering that through your relationship with your director father. And that must have been very complicated. You mean God? <laughs> Oh, the, uh, the, the little father. Oh. Uh, yeah, the little father. Of, co of course. Um, uh, I would say that the, the well, I, I, that it's been interesting to find structure in life would be the blanket statement. And that growing up as a human being on the planet in a kind of post routine culture, right? Like we don't, I didn't grow up all going to church on Sunday. I didn't grow up where there was a set uh, of moral boundaries that everyone had to follow. I grew up in a really flexible environment, which was an incredible privilege. But what that can lead to is a sense of purposelessness. Like, wait, so what God do I serve? Um, where, where do I put my effort, my work, into something bigger than me? How do I make sure I'm caring about something other than my own self-actualization and myself? And when I found Flannery, I found a young person who was negotiating uh, intense ambition and intense self-doubt and, uh, and, and a powerful creative mind trying to find where to, to root that. And I, I was fascinated by it. Um, and it made me think differently about myself, and it gave me something to bring to my dad that I thought he hadn't read yet, which was my general goal, uh, was <laughs> to, to, to find some ability to be original um, uh, uh, within a, uh, a household that was wildly creative and experimental already. Um, so uh, that's how I would answer your question today. It's a great answer, thank you. Um, we will take some time for your questions. Just one more question I want to ask for Laura and all of the cast, really, which is the film weaves um, Flannery's life, her biography, together with her fiction. And I wonder what, is, what that's like as actors, both at the script level when you're working through that and how your characters will uh, intermingle, but then also on set when you are in Flannery's world and when you're in her fictional world? How are those things worked out on set as actors? Well, I think there's the, the preparation process. Unfortunately, we had source material. You have the stories, so everything you need is there. And I found the, the, more, the fiercely more dedicated I was to what I saw on the page, the more it would sort of come to life. And we had spectacular designers. Our costume design, hair and makeup, all of that was remarkable. Production design, lighting, Steve Cousins, like all of that made an enormous difference. Um, as far as weaving back and forth between the stories, you find that writers tend to write about what they know. And the, the writing that is the most, I find, potent is where life and art intersect. And I think Flannery knew what she was doing with that. And I think she went deeper and deeper every time she wrote. So it was. It, once we had the conceit that Flannery would be all of the younger you know, characters and that Regina would be all the older ones, then you look at variations on a theme and you try and make them each unique, but each with purpose, each representing something specific that, that Flannery was trying to represent. Thank you. I'd like to hear from the others as well. And, and maybe just a little note on what this guy is like as a director from each of you. Christine, do you want to start? Oh, my. <laughs> Um, I, I got to tell you, tonight was the first time that I saw the film, so I am right where you are. Wasn't it great? <laughs> I, I was just telling Willa backstage that I had this real surreal moment one day on set when it was right when he was directing the beautiful moment when I, I tell Maya's character that she has lupus. And he was kneeling next to me uh, very quietly and he was whispering something in my ear. And I, I was listening to you very carefully, but then I said, oh my God, Ethan Hawke is kneeling next to me and whispering <laughs> in my ear. So, okay, okay, so that's what it was like. In addition to, I have never been directed by an actor, ever. They were always directors, and so his compassion for understanding where we were coming from 24-7 and how we felt was unlike any experience I've ever had. That's and great. And hope to duplicate. Yes. 
Let's hear from the rest of you. Are we going in order? Yes, as you like. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, the, the, yeah, I'm going to echo that. I think, you know, when you're sitting there and you're trying to submit to a director's process, it's really easy when it's Ethan Hawke because he bends over and he tells you what you need to do and you just go, yeah, I think I'm going to fucking listen to that. Uh. Um, and the same thing happens with Maya. I mean, Maya is one of the most sort of incredible scene partners I've ever had. And, and it's, it really is that, that rally back and forth of, of somebody coming at you with incredible, incredible acting and you're just trying to keep up. Um, and so I think a, a lot of this process was being surrounded by people who take the process of creating art really seriously and understand its fundamental function for us as people. Um, this too was my first time seeing the film. I also only had read the Parker's backstory. <laughs> um, so I didn't know none of that shit. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know she had polio. I, <laughs> um, <laughs> news to me. Uh, <laughs> but I think, I think then I got to have the same experience that you all got to have, which is questioning what do words mean? What do storytellers mean for us? And I know not everyone here is a part of the, the union moment that we're having right now, but it's about art and stories and the value of them. Um, and so I'm just kind of really moved right now about how important stories are and, and, and what their value is um, for us as people. Um, and so I'm just really grateful that we got to do this together and that we get to be here with you all. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm next. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, I guess if you're lucky enough to work on something that uh, moves your soul uh, when you're in it, it kind of uh, feels like a real experience in a way, or a, a collaboration. The collaboration feels like you're creating something new. And you know, I was lucky enough to work with Ethan on First Reformed, and uh, there's a part of me, and I've told you this before, but you know, we were just all day there all day in that room and, and it feels like a real conversation I had in my real life. So every time I see you, I'm like, I can't even, like. And then uh, being invited into this world and getting to share that experience with you and then getting you to direct um, and look into Maya's eyes and working with her in, in, in a soulful way, it's like mind boggling on like a meta level, on a creative level on, and everything. And um, yeah, you're, uh, creative curiosity and energy is so, um, uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Palpable. But palpable <laughs> and infectious. And so um, working with you as a director, it feels, it just, just feels all like creating art or something. And, and if, you know, it, I, I don't know, when you get together with people who are creatively inspired, you can just like ride a wave or something. So yeah, I don't know. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> And, and Willa. I mean, I feel like it's all been said, but I will add that I think that Ethan and Maya both created an environment in which everyone felt like part of a family. And I think that's not always what happens when you're on set, especially when you're just jumping in for a day here and there. And I think that that creates one of the safest spaces as actors that you can enter and it allows for a process for everybody that's like very rare and um i think is why this movie is so freaking special and also my first time seeing it and i'm so moved but wait can i say something <laughs> yes I, I just wanted to say that the one betrayal that i think was made of, of flannery in this movie is that she was a very lonely person and that this was one of the least lonely experiences of my life <laughs> Um, and that these people, like, it didn't feel like family. It is family. Um, and, like, all of the, some relationships were made on this set, very few. Um, most of them were pre-existing. And, um, and, and are people who have been in our lives and around us and who we love and value and like to act with. And, and I think that one way that we switched between the stories and life is we let it be playing pretend. Um, and we let it be stories because that's what they are, even within the movie. They're stories, their imagination, and they're playing pretend, and we get to play pretend with our friends and our family and our creative family, and that 
was the great betrayal and great fortune of this process, I think. Fantastic, thank you. All right, we've got a little bit of time for your questions. If you've got a question, please put up your hand and we can see you. Let's look up, a, nobody up in the balcony, really? Yeah, there we go, right at the very back. Let's start there. Uh, the question is, uh, the, uh, the gentleman can't imagine as an actor not finding a role for yourself. Did you ever think about that? Every day, every second. <laughs> um, do, do you think I don't want to like do scenes with Laura and everybody? I, I, um, uh, my wife is my producer and she would say, are you serious about filmmaking or are you not? Are you good? They need a director. They don't need a ham bone. And so, uh, she, she protects me from my worst self. But I definitely wanted to. <laughs> All right, let's go right here. Can, sorry, can you just speak louder. up a little louder, please? The question is, how do you negotiate uh, the, the difference between reading, writing, praying, which are such solitary activities, with the collective activity of acting and making the film? I have a really, like, woo answer. Go for it. Um, collective unconscious. Like, that we're, we are all one being. Like, uh, the way that ants in an anthill are. And, like, we, all the players in this movie, all the people in this theater, all the people in Toronto and so on are like, are, are both individuals and are one mind. And you can take a group of people and explore the psyche of a singular person because it's an aim, what, what an individual actually is, is an amorphous concept um, that's sort of irrelevant, um, I, I think. And so I love translating art forms into different art forms and sometimes you need more than one mind. This one you did. Wow. <laughs> All right. Woo! <laughs> no, you're blowing our minds. I like it. I like it. Okay, we've got a few more. Yes, right here? Yep. <laughs> you had your hand up. <laughs> Questioner really loved Blaze and wondered what was the difference between directing that film and this one. Blaze was like a rock opera. It was um, incredibly improvisatory from the way we worked the camera to the way the performances worked. Um, I started with a 40 page script. It was a different animal, you know. And this, Steve Cousins, who's here tonight, who's our cinematographer, um, we really wanted to match, yeah. Um, we, Blaze was big and messy and sloppy and strange and Flannery was razor sharp and deliberate and we wanted to match form and content as best as possible so the, the performances had to be so specific. A lot of the, the, the way it's shot it, it was uh, demanded a lot of the act. Everything needed to be razor sharp because you just feel her going, what is that? No, get rid of that. I mean, short story writers, you learn so much from them because they can kind of give you a novel in, in 15 pages. They, and, and so we wanted to, do, to try to match that precision um, and that unpredictability, but consistency, you know, like that, that was for all of us. So it was a very different animal. Okay. Thank you, just time for uh, one more. We'll go right back here, go ahead. A 
Okay, I didn't fully hear that, did you? I, did you, I, the, I got it. You got, you got it? it? Scene okay. with Liam Neeson. Um, it was about me, so I listened really close. Excellent. Um, <laughs> I like that. I paid a lot of attention when I heard my name. Um, uh, well, how did we work on that scene with Liam? We worked on it the way that we worked on all the scenes, which was with a lot of time. I said this before, but I don't think I could have played this part. Whether or not I played it well is up for debate, but I don't think I could have played it at all if I hadn't had as much time as I had to sit with this character. Um, there are like lines from that um, monologue that I said in the mirror when I was 15. Um, so I had some time. And, uh, and, and then it's just the way that we worked on this movie. We worked on it in, like, in the living room um, of our rental house in Kentucky where we were lucky enough to shoot this movie. And we'd have rehearsals and we brought people together and we worked on the scene and we worked on it differently with each person depending on how they wanted to tackle it and how we did that day for that material. And so th that, and writing that scene, we worked on for a long time too. Um, and then it just, the, you know, you let the writing jump, jump up um, all by itself and try not to get in its way. Fantastic, thank you. Wow, this that is fun. Thank you guys, all thank all you up there. Thank you, so thank you everybody. What an honor to be with you. Thank you, Cameron. My hands sweaty. <laughs> All right.